All right. So today we'll be talking about program flow control. Uh, I mentioned this on the first day that when you program a computer, uh, you have things like decisions and things like loops. Um, so a decision might be analogous to telling somebody in your family, if it's raining, take a raincoat. Uh, or if it's snowing, wear a heavy coat and gloves. Otherwise, wear a light jacket. Um, or in the case of uh, navigating, um, if the street name is Elm Street, turn left. Or if you're in a traffic circle, looping around and around, keep going until you see the proper exit and then exit. So programming a robot is partly about teaching it how to make those decisions based on things like sensors. So we've touched on a couple of these in the previous sessions, but we'll be digging deeper today. Um, wait allows you to say that the program should wait until something happens. If the robot is already in motion because you turn the motor on, uh, telling the program to wait will not stop the program if, if you turn on one or more motors. Uh, it tells the program to wait. Uh, and there's a couple of different variations on wait we'll look at. Uh, looping is typically done either with a repeat block or a forever block, and we'll look at those. And decisions in Scratch are done with if-thens or if-then-elses. Um, we'll cover those. I mentioned repeat. Um, and uh, we'll also touch briefly on something called a stop block, uh, which affects loops, particularly uh, when you choose the forever option when you're looping. So here's the wait block. Uh, this particular variation is uh, wait for a particular amount of time. Uh, wait one second, you change that to five seconds, three seconds, 2.5 seconds, whatever you want. If you order to turn the uh, motors on or told it uh, to move forward, uh, unless you've given conditions on that previously, it, that will continue while the program waits for whatever number of seconds you tell it. You can also tell it to wait until, and this trapezoid means you need to plug in something that's going to either be true or false, but uh, not permanently, because if you know it was true, um, then the wait would never occur. If you knew it was false, uh, for sure, forever, then the wait would wait forever. Wait until uh, false essentially means wait forever. So what you plug in here is something that's going to change, typically either a sensor reading or something based on sensor reading. So here's an example program. Uh, when the program starts, set the movement speed for the axles that are driving the wheels to 20%. Uh, set of the motors to B plus C, which means we're going to be using B and C motors um, to drive the robot forward. That means we've got those two motors plugged in to the B socket and the C socket, or also called ports. Um, and we're going to tell it that we think our wheels are three inches in circumference, so each time those motors rotate, they're going to cause the robot to travel three inches. Then we tell it to start moving. And it's going to keep moving until we tell it to do otherwise, but we tell it the program to wait for 5.5 seconds. And then we tell it to stop moving. So that means the robot moved for 5.5 seconds. Then we wait for 10 seconds for some reason. And then we change the movement speed to 40%. And we tell the robot to start moving, but not straight ahead. Uh, to make a curved right turn. And after it's uh, done that, we tell it to uh, move one inch 
out again in a right turn. And then we tell it to uh, start moving. So these are kind of redundant. I don't think we do all three of those settings. I, I need to make this a more realistic example. And then we tell it to, uh, since it started moving, we want it to keep it moving. So we tell the program to wait until the color sensor plugged into port A sees black, which probably means the color sensor is pointing down at the map. And we're looking for a black stripe on the map. And when that happens, the program will go on, perhaps stopping the motor or changing the speed or the direction of the motor. Any questions about that? So there's no block in uh, Scratch called loop. Uh, but there are blocks that cause loops, and one is called a repeat. Um, and you can think of it like a traffic circle, although um, most traffic circles, by the nature, have multiple exits. Um, a scratch loop has a single exit, and you, you uh, tell it when it should exit by uh, specifying the condition for exit. If you uh, give it a condition that's never going to occur, it will loop forever. Um, and if the robot is moving, that means the robot will move uh, until it runs into something. Another loop block is called repeat. Um, and one version of the repeat is uh, for a particular number of times. Uh, so in this first block, you would insert other blocks it would tell the robot to do things, and it would do those things 10 times in a row. Uh, might be analogous to telling a child that's been noisy in class uh, to write on the whiteboard, I will be quiet 10 times. Um, the uh, forever block uh, loops forever unless another block, which is called the stop block, causes it stop looping and we'll touch on stop blocks a bit later. Another way to get a forever loop to stop is to reach out and push the uh, stop button on the robot in a competition that might cause some, uh, cost some bonus points but might be worth it in some circumstances if the robot has made some major points and now needs to come back to home base to be sent out on more missions. Another type of block that gives you control is called an event block. And three of, uh, or more of those event blocks associated with sensors. Um, the first one on this uh, slide is uh, the, the bricks or the blocks that are plugged into this and are therefore stacked just below it, uh, shall be executed when the color sensor plugged into port A sees red. Well, a stack of blocks will, be, will not do anything unless and until uh, the sensor sees red and then the, the blocks below it will execute. We haven't plugged anything in on, on this uh, slide, but we'll see, see some things plugged in in later slides. Another possibility is uh, that you're using the force sensor and you're saying that you want a series of blocks uh, to be executed or to run when uh, the force sensor is pressed. And that could be pressed by a finger. There might be some circumstances where the uh, team member wants to press uh, the force sensor. But a more uh, automated way of moving it would be, as I mentioned yesterday, having some kind of lever arm or push bar or push against the sensor when the robot comes up against something, uh, causing it to trigger that sensor and then causing the robot to do something different than it was doing before. The third example here is uh, the icon referring to the ultrasonic or distance sensor. And uh, we're pretending that it's also plugged into A. If you were using all three of these sensors, you definitely have them plugged into different ports. Um, and in this particular example of the use of the block, it's looking 
uh, to see if it's detecting something within 8% of its maximum range. I don't know why they give you the percent option uh, because the much more precise ones can be accessed by this drop down menu by clicking right here. Uh, and you can then choose centimeters or inches and tell it how many centimeters or inches to use to trigger uh, a series of blocks connected to this. Another uh, event is a timer uh, getting to a certain number of seconds. Uh, that's not something you plug in, so there's, there's no reference to a port for that block. Uh, the timer is built into the hub, and you have control of starting the timer and uh, using that timer needing to check its current value. The final one on this slide uh, is a trapezoid because you can plug anything in there you want that is trapezoid in shape. Uh, and all the trapezoid shapes in Scratch generate true or false values. And that could be a, a sensor reading that produces true or false or a, a logic equation that we'll get to tomorrow um, where you, you're comparing two things and say, if this and this is true, then the logic uh, will be, uh, conclusion will be true. Or you can say, if this or this is true, then it should be true, and a variety of other combinations. Uh, co uh, complex logic is less common, but is uh, available uh, as your team gains more sophistication in, in the way they want to program the robot. Any questions about event blocks? So we talked about most of these. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the stop block. Oop, nope, we're going to talk about the wait block. Um, this one waits for a certain number of seconds. Uh, the program waits. Uh, any motors are running to continue to run. So let's take a look at the example where we've got uh, a loop and we've got weight blocks. This, uh, this particular event for starting all these blocks is the program itself starting, not waiting for a button to push, be pushed, or a sensor reading. It'll start immediately set, setting the movement speed to 50%, declaring that our um, motors for our wheels are connected to B and C, um, that we think that the circumference of our wheel is three inches, so that each axle rotation corresponds to three inches of motion, and that we want it to start moving straight, and then we want to repeat something 10, sec 10 times. And what is it that we want to repeat? The three blocks we plug into the repeat. Uh, wait two seconds for some reason, and then uh, cause the robot to move right at a 60% turn, so it's not turning in place, but a relatively sharp turn on one rotation of the axle. And then after it's done that, uh, continue moving and wait for two seconds. So that means that it's going to move straight for two seconds because it's going to loop around and do this again. So each of these waits, even though it looks like the robot is waiting, in fact, both at the beginning of this loop, where we have it moving straight, and each time around the loop, it's moving straight. So these two second waits correspond to the robot moving forward for two seconds. Eventually, it's going to have finished doing that 10 times, and then we tell it to stop moving, and we reset the speed to a negative value, which says that the next time we tell the robot to move, we want it to back up. And then for some reason, we tell it to wait for three seconds, and then we put it in a forever loop, uh, telling it to uh, move forward, move straight for, for uh, 12 rotations, but we, we told it the uh, speed was minus 50, so it's actually gonna back up for 12 rotations, and then it's going to turn left uh, for one rotation, and then it's going to do that again and again and again. Why, when might it stop? Well, on the screen, we've got uh, another stack of blocks, and the event for this other stack is when the color sensor uh, connected to A sees red, stop moving. So even though uh, this will go 10 times, and if it finishes, this will go forever, as soon as the robot finds red, 
um, uh, it will stop the movement of the robot. And that's probably designed because it will stop uh, if this forever loop, because otherwise it, it's going to keep uh, going, telling the robot to do that over and over and over again. So if there's no red on the map, it will do it forever, and, it, and eventually it'll run into something or the team will press the stop button. If there's red on the map, but there's something wrong with the navigation and it never gets to find the red, again, it'll do it forever. Any questions about this example? So the next uh, control flow block is the if then else. Um, the simple of the true is the if then. It basically says if a particular true false state that is true, then do the blocks that are plugged in to that block. And what could go in there could be a sensor block that's a trapezoid that generates true false, or it could be something more complicated. And if it's false at the time this block is executed, then the whatever's in here will not be executed. It will go on to whatever's plugged in below that block. A slightly more complicated version of that is if condition, then do what's in this gap, what you plug into that gap. Otherwise, do what you plug in to this gap. Uh, so this would be like, uh, Monday when I mentioned, if you've got uh, baking powder, then put in one teaspoon. Else, uh, I'll put in a half a teaspoon of cream of tartar powder and a half a teaspoon of, uh, of baking soda. Obviously, that's not, not the robot analogy. Questions about if, then if, then else? I have a question. Um, from the previous slide, that uh, interruption uh, when, you know, when you see red stop moving, that's not connected to the rest of the flow anywhere. So does that apply for the entire program or is there a way to tell it that uh, that only applies during the forever loop or something like that? Uh, the way it's set up here, it applies to the entire program. Um, and this is a concept that will take uh, you and the team members a while to get used to. The fancy term for this is multicasting uh, or multi-threading or uh, multiple processes, uh, which uh, many programming languages don't have, but this version of Scratch does. And it is particularly useful for real-time control of a robot. Um, so, um, as I said, the left-hand stack, uh, because the condition is program start, it will begin executing immediately, but the right-hand stack will wait to execute unless and until it finds red, and it will trigger whenever that happens, even if it, if you are not at the forever loop yet. Um, the, uh, if you're in that repeat 10 times, it'll stop the movement until uh, it's told to start again. Um, so, uh, we might, instead of saying just stop moving, we might want to stop the whole stack, and that's a different stop block that we'll get to uh, shortly. Um, but to address your question, if you wanted it, uh, this particular thing to be conditional on being in a particular stage of the program, you might create a variable, and we haven't talked about variables yet, that'll be tomorrow, um, and you might initially set that variable to false, and when you get to a certain stage in your program, you could set that variable to true, saying uh, maybe the variable is called uh, LF, or loop forever. So set loop forever to true, and then you put an if statement here that if you see, if it's red and you're currently uh, in the forever, then you do the stop. So you can make it as complicated as you want by adding additional blocks. Uh, and you can even make uh, what triggers this, instead of being a simple triggering on um, red, you could have this event be a logic statement that builds in a variable and a uh, color sensor all in one uh, logic statement. Again, that gets more complicated and uh, will be a little bit clearer when we get into data, uh, data manipulation. 
get you smart. So here's an example of, of uh, using the if statement. Uh, starts out again, setting uh, the speed to 50%, saying the motor to connect to B and C, uh, that one rotation is three inches, and that we want it to start moving. Um, this time we're going to repeat 50 times, but each of those 50 times we're going to be checking um, if we're over red. If we're over red, we want it to slow down to 10% speed. If we're not over red, we want it uh, to go at 50% speed. Now, I'm not sure exactly how that would come up on a playing field at first Lego League, but I can give you an analogy. This would be like uh, some foreign country that decided instead of having speed limit signs, um, they paint the street red wherever they want the uh, speed limit to be 10%. Um, and maybe that's in an autonomous cars in the future where maybe the cars can't always read the street signs. Maybe, maybe the streets will be colored to teach the autonomous cars what the speed limit is. Just making this up, of course, but uh, uh, there might be some case that would be similar to this, uh, where maybe you're approaching a wall and you know there's a red stripe below the, before the wall, so you want to slow down and start using the distance sensor to determine when they actually stop. Um, then after it's finished that 50 times of doing that, then it goes to the forever loop and it looks for black and when it finds black, it stops. Um, so if there was no black to be found, this forever loop would go forever. And this stop is not stopping just the motors, it's stopping the entire program. And that block we'll talk about uh, more explicitly in a minute. Questions about this program? Oh uh, yeah, I have a question there too. Um, the repeat 50, that's just checking a sensor. So it seems like that would execute 50 times in a fraction of a second, is that correct? Uh, great insight. Um, yep, yep, it sure would. So um, if, to make it more realistic, uh, you might put in a weight and the weight would not cause the robot to wait, but it would uh, cause the loop to wait before it checked again. So if you waited a tenth of a second, then 50 times uh, would be five seconds uh, for the total elapsed time of the loop. Uh, and that uh, would uh, be more, much more realistic than uh, even though the microprocessor inside the hub is not as fast as some, uh, it can certainly uh, do, do this loop 50 times in, in much less than a second. So good insight. So I mentioned that uh, we can put a logic statement in some blocks, and this, this is not the event block, this is the repeat block. You can tell that instead of looping for a specific number of times or uh, for a uh, forever, that you want it to, uh, to repeat until a particular condition occurs. And that could be until a variable is set, perhaps by uh, an equation in the loop, or um, and you could put a, uh, a sensor block in here that generates true or false, or you could take the sensor value and uh, compare it uh, to something in a uh, logic statement. Again, we haven't seen the logic equations yet, but anything that generated true or false could be plugged in here and determine how long this loop is going to execute. So let's look at an example of that. Uh, one of the blocks that's associated with the color sensor is a true false block, um, and it's got that trapezoid shape. And we're basically saying uh, we want this loop to repeat until the color sensor plugged into A detects red. Uh, and while it's repeating, we want to start moving, um, program to wait for two seconds, then uh, the, the first move is straight, and then move right for uh, 1.5 seconds, and then keep going. And we're taking some kind of oval type uh, movement, trying to find that red. Again, is, is that, would that be exactly useful on any one map? Well, not that I know of, but 
I suppose we could design a map that could uh, use something like this to find red and then um, do something with the pound it. So once uh, the repeat loop is finished, uh, instead of continuing the right move, which is the last thing it did in the repeat, it will hit this stop block and then stop moving altogether until another block has it otherwise. Questions about this example? So here's another block that can take a trapezoid. Uh, the uh, weight block tells the program to wait until that condition is true. So we earlier saw a weight that said wait for a particular number of seconds. Well, you could put a timer block uh, in there uh, and make that time be the condition, but you already have a separate block for that. But this is the more flexible block where you can plug in anything that will generate a true or false and uh, it will wait until it becomes true. So here's an example of that. Uh, when the program starts, uh, declare that the drive the wheels are on C and D and we want the robot to start moving straight and we want the program to wait until uh, port A color sensor sees red, and then you want the robot to stop moving. Um, so that that this is a more realistic thing. If there was a red stripe somewhere on the field, the team could point it in the direction of the red stripe uh, in the uh, uh, starting box in the home and uh, tell it to go, and it would race downfield uh, and until the uh, color sensor probably pointing down at the mat, I uh, detected red, and then it would come to a stop. Uh, would, be that, would that be the only thing it did? Well, perhaps if, if the red happened to be right where it pushed on some kind of mechanism to gain points, more likely it would um, go on to start a, a motor or make a turn or do something else after it found the red. Questions on this one? So I've been promising uh, to talk about stop. This is not stopping the motor. This is stopping the stacks of blocks in the program. And we already saw one example of that even before I described this. If we're running a particular stack of blocks where we know that our program has other stacks and we want those other stacks to stop on a certain condition, uh, the stack of blocks that we're running at, uh, we're programming at the moment um, might have an if statement, and if a certain condition occurs, it would, uh, in the, the uh, then part of the if, it would have the stop block to stop all the other stacks. Another possibility is uh, the um, block that gives you three choices. Uh, the one that's shown here is uh, stop and exit the program, which means absolutely everything, no matter how many stacks of blocks you have, will stop and the program will be done until um, the team uh, selects a different program or maybe the same one again and tells it to go. But you have two other choices. You can say stop all stacks, but since you didn't execute, um, that kind of raises the question what happens next. Um, well, if there's another a stack of blocks that can be keyed on a condition, then there's a chance that that will still happen and that uh, that set of blocks will run. Um, but other than that subtlety, uh, stopping all the stacks, uh, given that this block doesn't have anything it can plug into it, it doesn't have a place right here to plug in other blocks, that must mean that this stack is done. And uh, so we, we need either where it's equivalent to stop and exit, or there's some other stack of blocks that is uh, still could be run based on an event that has has possibility of occurring. Uh, a more realistic uh, example would be we want to stop this stack because uh, it's 
finish what it's doing. Uh, keep it needed to do something when it detect the grab. Need to do something when it uh, the distance sensor detected a certain distance uh, or some other condition. And now this stack box is finished, so we put in a stop uh, to stop the stack. Now the default for a stack of blocks is when you if you get to the bottom and there's no more blocks, then the stack is done. So why would you need stop this stack? Uh, well, you might have it in a loop where if you exited the loop, you get to the bottom of the stack of blocks and it would implicitly stop. But you may need an explicit stop in a loop under a certain condition. Uh, you want to stop the program even before it gets to the end. So those are more unusual and for more sophisticated, uh, complex situations. Um, and so I would recommend that you uh, put this block uh, into uh, the team's bag of trips on day one, um, but it, uh, you might want to add it to the mix uh, as the season goes on, or if uh, they ask you a question and uh, like, is there a way of getting this program to stop? Well. You can answer those kind of questions as long as you don't personally write the program. Questions about this slide? Well, we said that the if and the repeat and the forever, uh, you can plug things into them and you can plug each other into them. So repeat can have an if in it. Um, and we'll see other examples where uh, the ifs can have repeats in them. So this particular program doesn't do anything because we uh, we just plugged in these uh, flow controls and uh, we haven't given the robot anything to do, but you can imagine that in the if case, on, we would plug in a condition and then we tell the robot to do something. And uh, uh, down here in this repeat, uh, we would have it do something in this if case, and down here would wait for something. Questions are about that? So here's a, an example that's a little bit more realistic. Uh, the robot. Uh, is told its movement speed should be 50%, and the program is informed that the wheels are plugged into B and C, the wheel motors, and that the, we should assume that the uh, circumference of the wheels is three inches, and we tell it to start moving straight. And then this loop goes on forever, except that it's got stops in it, but these are stop moving, and so the, this program will continue. Uh, but the robot will stop under certain circumstances. Um, so that if, if there's another stack of blocks that has other things to do, that may still be useful. It, it may not matter that this program continues to run. Um, if, if, or perhaps this is just a de facto stop. If you have to give the robot nothing else to do and you uh, tell it to stop moving, uh, then it doesn't matter if the program is going to continue to run um, until the team comes to stop. Maybe the two and a half minute clock runs out. So what are the conditions? Uh, the uh, touch sensor plug in for D is pressed, then we want to stop moving. Um, and if that's not true, we want to check to see if the uh, light sensor, the color sensor plugged in the port A, uh, is getting less than 50% uh, light reflected back. In other words, it's found a dark part on the map, then we want to stop. So we've given it two conditions for stopping mo motion, uh, but neither of those conditions will actually stop the program. Uh, so I'm not sure I would use this in practice, but uh, it, it could be used. I can make up an artificial way. Questions about this? The forever loop looks like it doesn't have any way of connecting to anything underneath it. Um, so is there a way to exit from that loop and uh, 
pick up the program with a, another action? Uh, no. If you use a forever loop, uh, that that's uh, by its nature the last thing in that stack of stack of blocks. So the the exit condition, if you wanted one, would be a different stack of blocks that might stop this forever loop if it needs to be stopped. And that other stack of blocks would proceed from there to do other things if, if there were other things needed uh, for the robot. So uh, another way of answering the question is um, don't encourage your team to do forever uh, loops. Uh, suggest that they can think about uh, events and repeats that are based on conditions. Perhaps on occasion they'll have a repeat based on a count, but most often they'll be based on a condition that uh, is associated with a sensor. And uh, that repeat forever might be used in a, in a more unusual circumstance where they have a, a way of stopping the program uh, with its, a separate stack of blocks once they get used to the notion that they have multiple stacks running um, based on various events occurring. Um, there's a, a trade off here in that uh, I argued that multicasting, having multiple stacks based on different events, is a, is a powerful way of being, getting real time control of the robot. But it's, it's not something that we, we run into in everyday life. Uh, but you could make up an analogy for the kids to think about. Um, a toddler, if you ask them to pick up the ball, they're going to use both hands. Uh, an athlete can be told uh, to dribble the ball with the right hand, block with the left hand, and run down court at the, or, uh, at the same time. Um, so humans are capable of multitasking, although it's a more sophisticated motion. Uh, motion. It takes more practice, uh, more thinking uh, to do well. So we've got all these sensors, and they can be used to control uh, the, uh, what's going on in the robot. Um, the ones that are easiest to think about are the ones on the left, uh, which are all the trapezoid shape, and therefore could be directly plugged in to any of those things that we saw, the events, uh, the ifs, uh, the repeats, um, all could be uh, have that trapezoid option. And you could plug in any of those. So you could uh, plug in uh, a color sensor condition. Uh, you, you could use the color sensor as a uh, grayscale sensor. Uh, and tell it the condition is based on the percentage of light being reflected. You could use the force sensor based on being pressed. You could use the distance sensor based, uh, based on percent, uh, more likely from centimeters or inches. Um, and um, the gyro built into the spike prime can also be used to, to detect um, the, the yes no condition of is the front of the robot tilted up uh, or is the robot being shaken? Uh, those would be pretty unusual things to do uh, programming a robot, but uh, the the gyro uh, built into uh, the spike prime is pretty sophisticated. So, in addition to the uh, feather, the other sort of routine thing of uh, using the gyro control a yaw turn, a left right turn, um, you can uh, ask it whether uh, it's currently up. And there's a drop down menu that I can show you if we have time. Uh, other conditions uh, that you can ask the gyro to record on, on yes or no. The uh, blocks on the right, because they're oval or rounded, return values. And they would need to, uh, in order to affect a decision by the robot, they need to go in some kind of formula or equation. And uh, we'll, we'll be getting into that tomorrow. And uh, we'll, we'll see a variety of blocks that take ovals. But uh, at, at the risk of, of bending our minds, these oval blocks, uh, the, uh, the pressure value could be plugged in right here where it's 50%. And we could say, uh, we're looking for 
a reflection percentage based on the current pressure va value of the pressure sensor because we plug in the pressure value into the percent field here. I don't, can't think of a reason you'd ever do that, but that just shows the flexibility of the language. Anytime you see a thing that's a, a oval that's almost circular in a, a block, you can plug in any of the oval blocks there uh, because it's looking for a number. I, often it'll be a fixed number, a constant like 50 or 15, but it can be a variable number based on an equation that produces a value or one of these uh, sensor blocks that can produce value. Questions about that? So what just changed? Uh, well, it was settled. Notice that on this slide, 4.2, it says spike prime. So I was talking about a bunch of trapezoids and ovals specifically with spike prime, including a fa fairly fancy set of gyros blocks. When we go to the EV3 blocks, uh, you have very similar power, but you don't see a, a bunch of those gyro blocks, but you see some other ones. So the selection of uh, uh, true false values and uh, numeric values that you can get back to the sensors is a bit different based on what sensors are in each kit. Uh, but the general approach to using it is the same. Questions about that? So we're going to get into uh, data tomorrow, but this is a foreshadow that uh, you have. Uh, logic equations, uh, logic operators that uh, can take other logic values. You can plug in hexagons into hexagons, or you can plug in uh, numbers in the hexagons, uh, excuse me, tra trapezoids. Uh, these are six sided, not, not eight sided. You can plug in ovals in, uh, to each other. Um, and Notice these diamonds, or excuse me, these trapezoids up here, the sensors and ovals could be plugged into any of these. So you can create equations by combining the light blue, um, is that cyan in color officially, uh, sensor blocks into these operator blocks. And we'll get into that tomorrow. So here's a, um, a nonsensical example of where, where we plug in various things. Uh, the first one generates a true false value uh, based on the thing plugged into it, and the second one uh, adds two uh, numeric values and subtracts the third one to get uh, a number that's used uh, for some reason. So, uh, this homework has two thought questions. And then an actual uh, hands on exercise. Um, the first thought question is if you study this uh, offline, we'll, we'll look at it briefly now, but I encourage you to look at this uh, between now and tomorrow. Um, we've got this sequence of if a, a, uh, a light sensor is detecting reflection. Then set a motion speed. Uh, then immediately another if. This one's an if then else. And based on the, the same light sensor being less than 40, it's you get the setting of either 40 or 20 percent. Then immediately checking to see uh, whether it's less than 60, and then making a decision. Um, and then after that, if I can get this gray bar to disappear artifact of Google Slides. Then it tells um, the robot to go straight. So I'll, I'll uh, help you on this. My interpretation of this sequence is, yes, it will do those uh, first two ifs, but it will do them lickety split. And uh, before the robot starts moving, because we haven't told it to move yet, it will do that third one, the if uh, reflection less than 60, that third one will set um, the movement speed to either 60 or 30, and that will be the one that counts for that motion block. And the first two 
will be a little bit of work for uh, with no consequence because they're overridden by the third if then else uh, that sets the uh, the speed uh, of the motors. In contrast, over here we've got uh, an if that first checks to ten percent, then only if it's less than ten percent, it does another check for less for, for greater than forty percent, uh, and then leaves the uh, speed at either forty or twenty. But if it wasn't ten percent up here, then it checks for greater than sixty percent and leaves it at sixty or thirty. I think, depending on uh, the value of that uh, grayscale use of the color sensor, you can end up with any of those four values, 40, 20, 60, or 30 for being for the movement speed. Uh, and you would have four different possibilities for how fast it would move uh, when it starts moving rather than just two on the map. So that's my interpretation of this thought experiment. You could even uh, put this into a pro, uh, into your robot if you did. Um, you set up, you could download this uh, with a robot with a light sensor, and you could experiment with it to see if my theory is right or your theory is right. Oop, I didn't mean to go forward. Part two is analogous. I, I won't read through this. Uh, in this case, we've got repeat blocks with if that else is in them. And, um, a challenge to kind of think through what we'll do in, in each of the cases and uh, how that will affect the motion of the robot. The third uh, part of the homework assignment is, is more hands on to actually uh, uh, at least think about how you would program the robot to do these series of steps and ideally actually uh, create such a program and download it into your robot and, and see it in action. Now, are we done 12 minutes ahead? Not really. Uh, I thought we might be, uh, get here before we're at five o'clock. So I wanted to foreshadow what we're gonna to do tomorrow. Um, go all the way to the end of this sequence. Show you what I was up to. I'm building the advanced driver base, uh, which is a more sophisticated robot than we used yesterday. Um, I'll hold up yesterday's robot. Yesterday's robot. What I'm building is about twice as big, still has the same hub, it uses bigger wheels and um, has more room for mounting sensors. Um, and it actually will have uh, two color sensors. Uh, the base kit uh, has only one color sensor, but the competition set that you buy through uh, first, if you go with Spike Prime, comes with another box of parts. Um, at the very end, I'll go grab that box of parts if you haven't seen it. Um, what I'm doing is whenever it tells me to build something in each of these parts, I've done this front part and half of the rear part, and then I'm going to do the left and right part and plug them all together to get this robot for tomorrow. Um, I'm dipping into the main kit, but if I can't find the part I'm looking for, like the big wheels or the second color sensor or these there's these uh, uh, swivel peg axles uh, that are blue, you can see one right there. It's not in the main kit. It is in the auxiliary kit. And I get into the auxiliary kit, make what I'm making, and put all this together. Um, I exit out of here um, and go to home, go to building instructions. I'll show you where I was. I'm building advanced driving base assembly. And all those four things go together to make this one robot that we'll be using tomorrow. And we'll be using a lesson, which we're going to uh, preview now. It's uh, in this same 
uh, yellow uh, group of lessons, the competition ready, that you scroll quite a bit down. Wow. And this lesson tells you to build that robot. And that's what I'm, I'm doing. And then this one um, uh, uses the gyro to make some moves. We might have some time to look at that. But the one I think you'll find particularly interesting, go back to home, go back uh, to lessons, and go back to competition ready. And I showed you this bruise, uh, briefly uh, earlier in the week, the crane mission from last year. And I think if you download the latest version, instead of the crane mission from last year, it'll have one of the missions from this year with a suggested solution. But I don't want to get ahead of the game. I don't have the map for this, for this season, but I do have the map for last season. So we'll be doing this mission tomorrow. We have some intro, and then it tells us to make sure we've got the crane. I've got the crane built in the box. Um, it tells you to set up the game field. So let me stop my share for just a second. And change my webcam. Bear with me. There's the playing field. Got set up for tomorrow, except I haven't put the crane on. I need to mount the crane. I need to build, finish building the robot. And uh, I can uh, get in that, into that tomorrow. And here's the program. So let's take a, a, do a preview of the program that we'll be testing tomorrow to see if it, it uh, partially solves the crane mission. This sample program is part of the lesson. Uh, sets the movement speeds, um, sets the movement motors to A and E. The circumference it tell, uh, says to assume they're 27.63 centimeters in circumference to both wheels and sets the movement speed of 30. Uh, there's a third motor that's plugged into D that accepts its speed of uh, 30% and wiggles uh, that motor by uh, telling it to go counterclockwise one second and clockwise 70 degrees. Um, then it moves the robot itself forward for 40 centimeters. Uh, and the comment says that should put it over the black line. And then it repeats this loop. Um, until uh, the color sensor detects that the reflection is less than 50%, uh, which maybe means it, it left the black line. Let's see what the comment says. It says, part two, follow the line until the right color sensor detects the color black. Okay, so it's uh, less than 45%. Uh, it deems that to be uh, black. And meanwhile, while it's uh, the right color sensor is not on black, the left color sensor is looking for black uh, itself. And anytime it sees black, it uh, turns right by giving the left motor 25% power and the right motor 5% power. And then when it no longer sees black with the left sensor, it uh, turns left. Uh, by giving the left motor 5%, the right motor 25%. So it's going to be wiggling along the left edge of the black stripe until it, uh, until the right sensor uh, uh, sees black. And then it needs to go on to part three. And part three says stop moving and uh, turn the uh, actuator that's connected to uh, motor D by 50 degrees. Uh, wait one second and then turn it counterclockwise by 50 degrees. And then it says set the speed to negative 75% and turn left for two and a half rotations. What do the comments say? It says uh, 
the uh, blue blocks here are going to activate the crane by lifting the arm for long enough. And part four is to drive back to home base. So will it actually accomplish uh, the crane mission with this program? We'll find out tomorrow.